Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India module is designed to help you understand the basic anatomy and physiology of the urinary system the urinary system is also known as excretory system of the body it consists of two kidneys two ureters the urinary bladder and the urethra the kidneys filter the blood to remove waste products and produce urine so the principal function of the urinary system is removal of water soluble wastes other functions include water and electrolyte balance acid base balance blood pressure regulation and production of hormones that include renin erythropoietin and calcitriol by the end of this session you will be able to describe the basic structure of the urinary system make a labeled sketch showing major structures of kidney and nephron list the functions of the kidney know the processes involved in urine formation and concentration and where they occur explain the regulatory mechanisms that control these processes list the renal function tests and describe the gross and microscopic structures of the ureter urinary bladder and the urethra First we'll talk about the kidneys. The kidneys are reddish brown bean shaped retroperitoneal organs. They are placed on the posterior abdominal wall on either side of the vertebral column between 12th thoracic and 3rd lumbar vertebra. The right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney because of the large right lobe of the liver and is also slightly shorter and stouter than the left kidney. Long axis of the kidney is directed infralaterally along the border of psoas major muscle and the transverse axis is directed posterolaterally giving it two surfaces the anterolateral and the posteromedial surface anteriorly the kidneys are related to the suprarenal glands liver stomach right colic flexure left colic flexure second part of duodenum coils of jejunum pancreas and spleen Posteriorly the kidneys are related to the diaphragm 11th and 12th rib costo diaphragmatic recess of pleura psoas major muscle quadratus lumborum and transverse abdominis muscle the kidney is protected by a fibrous capsule surrounded on the outside by perinephric fat followed by the renal fascia that is the gerota's fascia and the paranephric fat here it can be remembered that while in simple nephrectomy for benign diseases kidney is removed within the renal fascia whereas in radical nephrectomy for cancer the entire contents of the perirenal space including renal fascia and paranephric fat are removed our kidney measures 11 to 12 cm in length 5 to 7.5 cm in width and 2.5 to 3 cm in thickness The students can remember it as 12 6 and 3. It weighs around 150 grams. It has two poles, the superior pole and the inferior pole, two margins, medial margin and lateral margin, and two surfaces, the anterolateral surface and the posteromedial surface. At the concave medial margin is a vertical cleft, the hilum. which is the entrance to the renal sinus at the hilum we see the renal vein which is anterior to the renal artery which is anterior to the renal pelvis so we can remember it as vap from anterior to posterior vein artery and pelvis renal sinus is a space just inside the hilum that contains the renal pelvis vessels nerves lymphatics and some amount of fat the kidney receives blood from the renal artery which is a branch of the abdominal aorta despite its small size 
our kidney receives around 20 to 25 percent of the cardiac output. Each renal artery branches into segmental arteries which divide into interlobar arteries that run between the renal pyramids. The interlobar arteries continue as arcuate arteries that run along the boundary of cortex and medulla. These then divide into interlobular arteries that feed into the afferent arterioles which enter the glomeruli. After filtration, the blood from the efferent arterioles and the peritubular capillaries converge into the interlobular veins, followed by the arcuate veins and interlobar veins that form the renal vein exiting through the hilum into the inferior vena cava. The lymphatic vessels follow the renal veins both in cortex and medulla. They reach the renal sinus where they empty into valved collectors and accompany the renal vein out of the hilum. They then drain into the right and left paraiotic, common iliac, internal and external iliac lymph nodes. The nerves to the kidney arise from the renal plexus that is located in the renal sinus. Renal plexus is composed of a large number of autonomic nerves that primarily have sympathetic activity from various sources that include celiac plexus, aortic plexus, superior hypogastric plexus, splanchnic nerves and the second lumbar sympathetic ganglion. Parasympathetic supply comes from vagus. Sensory input from the kidney travels to the T10-11 levels of the spinal cord. Thus, pain from the kidney is referred to the corresponding dermatome in the flank region. On cut surface, we see that the renal parenchyma is divided into a superficial renal cortex, which is pale brown in color, and a deep renal medulla, which is darker red-brown in color. Grossly, the medulla takes the shape of 6 to 18 cone-shaped pyramids. Between these pyramids, the cortex projects as columns of Bertini or the renal columns. The striations seen in the pyramids are due to the many straight tubules and blood vessels that are passing through. The tip or papilla of each pyramid empties into a minor calyx. The minor calyces join to form major calyces which empty into the renal pelvis, which then continues as the ureter. Just like the functional unit of the lung is the alveolus, the structural and functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. Each kidney has around 1 million nephrons. The nephrons carry out all the functions of the kidney. The nephrons are classified into two types based on their location and the length of their loops into cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. Here we should remember that all nephrons have their corpuscles in the cortex. 85% of the nephrons are cortical nephrons. These are located in the superficial cortex. They have short loop of Henle, so also known as short loop nephrons. These nephrons produce standard urine. The remaining 15% are the juxtamedullary nephrons. These are found at the boundary of cortex and medulla. They have long loop of Henle that extends deep into the medulla. They are responsive to ADH that is antidiuretic hormone and thus produce concentrated urine and are closely associated with vasa recta. The nephron is composed of the renal corpuscle which is the filtration unit the tubules which perform reabsorption and secretion and the collecting ducts which are involved in concentration and excretion of urine. The renal corpuscle forms the initial filtering component of the nephron. It consists of the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. Each corpuscle has a vascular pole and a tubular pole. The glomerulus is a capillary tuft between the afferent and the efferent arterioles which is about 200 micrometers in diameter. The endothelial cells lining these capillaries have fenestrae that are 70 to 100 nanometers in diameter. 
Since these pores are large enough, they allow for free filtration of plasma fluid, solutes and small proteins but not red blood cells. The glomerular endothelium sits on a thick basement membrane which is 250 to 350 nanometers. It is composed of type 4 collagen, laminin and fibronectin in a matrix of negatively charged proteoglycans. This basement membrane can be highlighted by special stains like methanamine silver, per iodic acid shift and Mason's trichrome. In between the capillaries are present mesangial cells. These cells stain more darkly, however, are difficult to distinguish in routine sections. They provide support to the glomerulus, respond to vasoactive substances and help maintain hydrostatic pressure for optimal filtration. Phagocytose protein aggregates, for example antigen-antibody complexes in many pathological conditions and secrete several cytokines that are important for immune defense and repair in the glomerulus. The glomerular capillary tuft is surrounded by a double-walled epithelial capsule that is the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule has two layers, the internal or the visceral layer which closely envelops the glomerular capillaries and the external or the parietal layer. In between these two layers is a space which is known as the Bowman's space which receives the filtered fluid. The visceral layer is formed by specialized cells known as podocytes, so called because they have pedicles or foot processes that embrace a glomerular capillary. In between these foot processes are elongated spaces around 30 to 40 nanometers wide. These are known as filtration slits. These spaces are spanned by a slit diaphragm formed by proteins podocin and nephrin. In addition, the foot processes have a negatively charged glycocalyx coat. Thus, they control the filtration of negatively charged molecules such as albumin. The parietal layer consists of simple squamous epithelium supported by a basal lamina and reticular fibers. At the tubular pole, this epithelium changes into cuboidal epithelium of the proximal convoluted tubule. Hence, the filtration barrier consists of the fenestrated endothelium with a negatively charged surface, the glomerular basement membrane which is also negatively charged, and the filtration slits between the foot processes of the podocytes which are also negatively charged. Thus proteins greater than 10 nanometers in diameter or greater than 70 kilodalton do not cross the filtration barrier. In diseases such as glomerulonephritis or diabetes mellitus, this filtration barrier is altered causing passage of small and big proteins both leading to protein use. Coming on to the tubules, the proximal convoluted tubule or the PCT is a long tortuous tubule. It is longer than the distal convoluted tubule, therefore is more frequently seen in the sections. The PCT is lined by cuboidal cells with abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm because of the presence of numerous mitochondria. The cell apex has long microvilli for reabsorption thus giving it a brush border appearance. The cells also have long basal membrane invaginations and lateral interdigitations with neighboring cells. The sodium potassium ATPase is localized in these basolateral membranes which pumps the sodium out of the cell. The cells of the PCT reabsorb around 60 to 65 percent of the filtered water along with almost all solutes and small plasma proteins. The PCT continues into the loop of Henle, which is a shorter, straight tubule that enters the medulla. It is a U-shaped structure with a descending limb and an ascending limb. The descending limb is thin, is mainly lined by squamous epithelium and is involved in making urine hypertonic and conserving water. The ascending limb has thick and thin segments. The thin segment is lined by squamous epithelium and the thick segment is lined by cuboidal epithelium. Point to be remembered here is that the thick and thin do not refer to the size of the lumen but it refers to the size of the epithelium. The loop of Henle is supplied by a network of straight capillaries descending from the efferent arterioles 
known as vasa recta the recta in latin means straight the loop of henle along with the vasa recta help to create a concentration gradient in the medulla which helps in production of concentrated urine the straight thick ascending limb of loop of henle becomes the tortuous distal convoluted tubule or the dct in the cortex dct is lined by simple cuboidal epithelium but as compared to pct the cells are smaller paler and have no brush border so the lumen appears larger in hne stain slides more nuclei are visible per section as the cells are smaller the dct is partly responsible for regulation of sodium potassium and calcium it is the primary site for hormone based regulation of calcium the point where the dct contacts the afferent arteriole of the renal corpuscle is called macula densa this portion is lined by tightly packed columnar cells with reversed polarity here comes in the juxtaglomerular apparatus it lies within the vascular pole of the glomerulus and the dct of the same nephron its major function is auto regulation of renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate through a mechanism known as the tubulo glomerular feedback which will be discussed later the juxtaglomerular apparatus is composed of three cellular components the macula densa of the dct the juxtaglomerular cells of the afferent arteriole and the extraglomerular mesangial cells also known as lasis cells the macula densa as we have seen is a specialized high columnar epithelium in the distal convoluted tubule which detects changes in sodium concentration if the sodium concentration is high the cells release a paracrine vasopressor that triggers contraction of afferent arteriole reducing the blood flow and thus gfr they also decrease renin release by inhibiting nitric oxide synthetase thus decreasing gfr the juxtaglomerular cells are modified smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole they secrete renin when the blood pressure in the afferent arteriole falls renin increases blood pressure via the renin angiotensin aldosterone system the exact function of the lasis cells is not well understood till date after the dct comes the collecting tubules urine passes from the distal convoluted tubule to the collecting tubules also called the ducts of bellini the last part of each nephron these collecting tubules join each other to form larger collecting ducts that empty into the minor calyces the collecting tubules are lined by cuboidal epithelium which are called principal cells scattered among the principal cells are darker staining intercalated cells that have more abundant mitochondria which help regulate the acid base balance by secreting hydrogen ions and absorbing bicarbonate ions collecting ducts are major component of urine concentrating mechanism they are lined by columnar cells that are rich in aquaporins which act as selective pores for passage of water molecule how do our kidneys function what are the steps involved in urine formation what is glomerular filtration rate how is the concentration of urine controlled how the nervous system hormones and the nephron itself regulates urine formation Hopefully you will be able to answer all these questions after a while. Now imagine a hypothetical waste removal system. We can have two options. System A that selectively picks up the waste products from the circulation and throws them out. But this system requires specific information about the waste product which is problematic. because there can be infinite number and types of possible waste products second option is system b that removes all the water soluble products from the circulation and selectively reabsorbs the required products back this system requires specific information about the necessary products which is of course possible but the problem with this system will be unnecessary requirement of extra energy To achieve adequate waste removal our kidneys filter 
180 liters of blood daily that is the entire plasma volume around 60 times per day that means the reabsorption process occurs 60 times in a day this needs lot of energy and so our kidneys although small in size constituting only 0.5% of the whole body mass utilize almost 1/4 of the cardiac output every day isn't that amazing have a look at this animation clip to understand the basic steps that are involved step 1 is glomerular filtration this is a passive non selective process dependent on the filtration pressure here we need to understand what is filtration pressure glomerular filtration rate and filtration fraction filtration pressure is the net result between the capillary osmotic pressure and the hydrostatic pressure it is the net driving force which pushes the fluid out of the capillaries glomerular filtration rate is the volume of fluid filtered from the glomerular capillaries per unit time the glomerular filtration rate is recorded in units of volume per time that is milliliters per minute normal glomerular filtration rate is 100 to 120 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meter square body surface area filtration fraction represents the fraction of the plasma reaching the kidneys which passes into the renal tubules it is thus the ratio of glomerular filtration rate to the renal plasma flow it is normally about 20% the remaining 80% leaves the glomerular capillaries by the efferent arterioles and becomes the peritubular capillary circulation the fluids and solutes are forced out of the glomerulus by hydrostatic pressure that is provided by the push of the heart that is the blood pressure and secondly since the efferent arterioles are smaller than the afferent arterioles the blood backs up in the glomerulus and pushes itself through so the molecules that are small enough to pass through the filtration barrier include water along with sodium potassium chloride bicarbonate ions glucose amino acids vitamins phosphates urea and uric acid this forms the filtrate red blood cells and large proteins are left behind that enter the efferent arterioles presence of any of these in the filtrate suggests a disease process involving the glomerulus the hallmark of kidney function is auto regulation of gfr although the mean arterial pressure may vary the kidney has a remarkable ability to maintain renal blood flow and gfr within normal limits this is achieved via renal auto regulation that encompasses two major mechanisms first is the myogenic mechanism when the blood pressure is high the smooth muscles of the afferent arteriole get stretched this stretch results in depolarization and activation of voltage gated calcium channels followed by influx of calcium ions that lead to constriction of the afferent arteriole which restores the gfr also the juxta glomerular apparatus significantly contributes to the fine tuning of the gfr the changes in the concentration of sodium chloride and potassium are sensed by the chemoreceptors in the macula densa and a series of events that follow is known as tubuloglomerular feedback an increase or decrease in the concentration of these ions elicits inverse changes in gfr by altering the vascular tone predominantly of the afferent arteriole thus it is a negative feedback mechanism so when the gfr is high there is increased sodium chloride delivery to macula densa hormones are secreted that act in a paracrine manner causing constriction of afferent arteriole and thus decrease the gfr next step is tubular reabsorption all the vital nutrients that left the blood during glomerular filtration are reabsorbed back into the circulation this is aided by thousands of microvilli that form the brush border of the proximal convoluted tubule 80% of the reabsorption occurs in the pct and the rest 20% takes place in the loop of henle dct and the collecting tubules
The tubular reabsorption occurs via three mechanisms. Number one, passive transport or diffusion. Number two, active transport. And number three, osmosis. Substances being reabsorbed can take one of the two routes. Paracellular, that is substances pass in between the cells, for example calcium. And transcellular, that is substances pass through the cell, for example sodium and glucose. The most important is the transcellular transport of sodium which is driven by sodium potassium ATPase present in the basolateral membrane of the epithelial cell. An electrochemical gradient is generated between the filtrate and the interstitial fluid. This gradient drives other solutes like chloride, glucose and amino acids out of the tubule. The positively charged ions Potassium, calcium and magnesium follow their electrochemical gradients out into the interstitial fluid. Some sodium ions are also reabsorbed by secondary active transport in return for the hydrogen ions in the filtrate. The movement of hydrogen ions provides the driving force to reabsorb bicarbonate. In the filtrate, hydrogen ions combine with bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates to form carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide gas diffuses into the tubular epithelial cell, combines with water to form carbonic acid again. Here again, carbonic acid dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Bicarbonate diffuses into the blood via the interstitium. Following the reabsorption of solutes, the water moves out via osmosis. This is known as obligatory water reabsorption. Now, the water in the solutes are in the interstitium. Blood inside the capillaries is hypertonic because of the presence of large proteins. So, the water and the solutes are drawn inside the capillaries by osmosis. The reabsorption of water increases the solute concentration in the filtrate, promoting further reabsorption of ions and urea. So, when the filtrate leaves the PCT, most of the ions, water and nitrogenous wastes are reabsorbed. As both water and solutes are reabsorbed in the PCT, the descending limb of loop of Henle receives isotonic fluid. The thin descending limb is freely permeable to water due to the presence of aquaporins but not to solutes. So passive transport of water occurs. The ascending limb is impermeable to water because of lack of aquaporins but reabsorbs around 25% of the filtered sodium chloride actively. In the distal convoluted tubule, around 5% of the sodium chloride is reabsorbed actively using sodium chloride sympotors. This is accompanied by reabsorption of water that follows via osmosis. Aldosterone that is released coming on to tubular secretion. The main goals of this process are to throw out the waste products that didn't pass the filtration barrier. To filter out any waste that may have re-entered the bloodstream during reabsorption and to maintain blood pH by getting rid of the excess ions. This step requires active transport mechanisms. The waste moves from the peritubular capillary into the interstitial spaces and into the tubule. In the PCT, some hydrogen ions are secreted by a sodium hydrogen antipoter. Also, ammonia inside the tubule cell combines with hydrogen ions to form ammonium ions that are secreted through the same antipoter. Other substances that are secreted include uric acid and organic acids produced from drug metabolism. In distal convoluted tubule, most of the potassium ions and hydrogen ions are secreted. Also, some ammonium ions and drug metabolites are secreted. So, the distal convoluted tubule plays an important role in maintaining acid-base balance of the body. In the collecting ducts, potassium ions are actively secreted by the sodium potassium pumps. Some hydrogen ions are also actively secreted using a hydrogen ATPase. Removing excess potassium ions and hydrogen ions from the blood maintains the blood pH and electrolyte concentration 
and this is what gives the urine its acidic quality. The last step is excretion of urine. The fluid that is excreted contains water, sodium chloride, potassium, hydrogen ions, urea, creatinine and other waste products. Since creatinine is neither reabsorbed nor secreted along the entire pathway, the excretion of creatinine, that is the creatinine clearance, can be used as a measure of the glomerular filtration rate. To summarize, the major steps involved in urine formation are filtration, reabsorption, secretion and excretion. Normal filtrate contains water along with sodium chloride, potassium, bicarbonate, glucose, amino acids, creatinine and urea. It should not contain any large proteins or red blood cells. Presence of any of these suggests a pathological condition affecting the glomerulus. In the proximal convoluted tubule, sodium chloride, potassium, water, glucose, amino acids and bicarbonate are reabsorbed and hydrogen ions, ammonium ions, uric acid and organic acids are secreted. In the descending limb of loop of Henle, most of the water is reabsorbed whereas the ascending limb is involved in reabsorption of sodium chloride. In the distal convoluted tubule, 5% of the sodium chloride along with water is reabsorbed and potassium ions, hydrogen ions, some ammonium ions and organic acids are secreted. In the collecting ducts, 5% of sodium chloride along with water is reabsorbed as is some urea and potassium and hydrogen ions are secreted. The composition of urine varies with the hydration status of the body. Our body functions best at osmolality of 290 milliosmoles per litre. For the purpose of discussion, we take a round figure of 300 milliosmoles per litre. If suppose a person is drinking lot of water, body fluids will become hypoosmolar. To compensate this, our kidneys will produce more urine. Since the concentration of waste products remains almost constant at approximately 600 milliosmoles of solutes, so the urine produced will be more in amount but diluted. On the contrary, if the water intake is less or in case of dehydration, the body fluids will become hyperosmolar. To prevent this, our kidneys will try to conserve water by producing little amount of urine. But since the concentration of waste products is still around 600 milliosmoles, so the urine produced will be much more concentrated. The basic requirements for these mechanisms to work efficiently are number one, medullary interstitial hyperosmolarity, and number two, antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. The medullary interstitial hyperosmolarity is produced by the loop of Henle acting as counter current multiplier and secondly by urea recycling and is maintained by the vasa recta acting as counter current exchangers. The long loops of Henle of the juxtamedullary nephrons control urine concentration by acting as counter current multipliers. How does it happen? The descending limb of loop of Henle receives isotonic fluid from the PCT. As the descending limb of loop of Henle makes its way into the deep medulla, the medullary interstitial osmolality increases from 300 to 600 to 800 to 1200 milliosmoles per liter. By virtue of the U shape, the loop of Henle is made capable of performing this job. To understand this, we'll have to start from thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. The thick ascending limb actively reabsorbs the sodium chloride out of the tubules. Since the limb is impermeable to water, water does not accompany the sodium chloride, so the osmolarity of the interstitium increases and that of the tubular fluid decreases. Water moves out of the descending limb via osmosis. This makes the tubular fluid reaching the ascending limb more concentrated. Now again, the ascending limb is not permeable to water but is permeable to solutes. 
Since the tubular fluid is more concentrated, sodium and chloride move out into the interstitium. This invites more water from the descending limb. This cycle keeps on repeating until the medullary interstitial osmolarity reaches its maximum of 1200 milliosmoles per liter. This gradient is created in the medullary interstitium, but how is it maintained? The vasa recta help prevent this medullary hyperosmolarity from being dissipated by acting as counter current exchanger. The walls of the vasa recta are freely permeable to both water and solutes. Water and solutes are passively exchanged between the interstitial fluid and the blood of vasa recta as a result of counter current flow. As vasa recta is going down, it is getting surrounded by more and more hyperosmolar interstitium. So it throws out water and takes up solutes. So from 300 it becomes 1200 in the deep medulla. Now the counter current starts. As the vasa recta ascends into a hypoosmolar interstitium, it starts losing solutes and gain water. So by the time it enters the cortex, its osmolality is again 300. Thus, there is little net change in the concentration of interstitial fluid at each level. This can only be achieved due to its U-shape again. So, if the body is dehydrated and wants to conserve water, the loop of Henle makes the area more hypertonic leading to more and more water reabsorption and thus excretion of small amount of concentrated urine. If there is excess water in the body, the solute concentration of tubular fluid is already less, so not much gradient is established, allowing the kidneys to produce large amount of dilute urine. The second thing that contributes to the medullary interstitial hyperosmolarity is urea recycling. The last part of the nephron, that is the medullary collecting tubule, is permeable to urea and some of the urea from the filtrate gets reabsorbed into the interstitium. From the interstitium, it diffuses back into the tubule and this becomes a cyclic process. Coming on to the role of ADH, osmoreceptors are present in the hypothalamus that sense the sodium concentration of blood. If the sodium concentration of blood is high, as in the case of dehydration, ADH is secreted from the posterior pituitary. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system when the blood volume is low, as in the case of dehydration, the juxtaglomerular cells of the afferent arteriole secrete renin. This renin converts the pre-enzyme angiotensinogen released by the liver to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by the angiotensin converting enzyme secreted from the lungs. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoactive peptide that causes vasoconstriction resulting in increased blood pressure. Angiotensin 2 also stimulates the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone acts on DCT and collecting tubules to increase the reabsorption of sodium and water into the blood. Aldosterone also stimulates posterior pituitary to release ADH which aids fluid retention. And it also stimulates thirst centers within the brain. All these activities lead to the rise of blood pressure. This rise of blood pressure can be dangerous at times. So to regulate the system, certain counter-regulatory hormones like atrial natriuretic peptide come into play. This is secreted by atrial heart muscles. ANP causes vasodilation of the afferent arteriole and constriction of the efferent arteriole leading to increase in GFR. It decreases sodium reabsorption in DCT and collecting tubules. It inhibits renin secretion and thus reduces aldosterone secretion, ultimately leading to increased sodium and water excretion from the body. So far, we have talked about the normal. Now, what to do if something goes wrong? Many diseases affect renal function. In some, there is selective impairment of glomerular function or tubular function while in some, several functions are affected. Renal function tests are performed to confirm the diagnosis of renal disease. They are used to monitor disease progress and to monitor response to treatment. 
Investigation of kidney diseases begins with urine examination, which will be discussed in a separate tutorial. This includes the appearance, odor, specific gravity, osmolality, pH, presence of proteins, glucose, ketones, urobilinogen, and bilirubin, which is tested using commercially available disposable dipsticks or conventional methods along with microscopy to see the presence of red cells, white cells, casts or crystals and culture for presence of any microorganisms. The routine kidney function tests include measurement of serum creatinine, creatinine clearance and blood urea. Their values start to rise if GFR falls below 30% of the normal. 98% of body creatine is present in the muscles where it acts as store of high energy. About 1-2% to of total muscle creatine is converted daily into creatinine which is freely filtered through the glomerulus. Plasma creatinine is not affected by diet. It is an endogenous substance, the concentration of which remains constant. Normal serum creatinine falls in the range of 0.8 to 1.4 mg per deciliter. Creatinine clearance can be used as a measure of the GFR. Mild degree of renal impairment can be detected by this test before the rise of creatinine or urea. Clearance is defined as volume of plasma cleared of the substance per unit time. It can be calculated by the equation U into V by P where U is the concentration of creatinine in urine, V is the volume of urine flowing per minute and P is the concentration of creatinine in plasma. Clearance is measured by using a 24-hour urine collection. Incomplete urine collection is a major source of error. So, an alternative and convenient method is by employing cockcroft gault formula where the GFR is derived by using serum creatinine value. So GFR is equal to 140 minus age into body weight divided by serum creatinine into K where K is a constant which is 1.23 for males and 1.04 for females. Normal creatinine clearance is around 120 to 140 milliliters per minute in adults. In children it should be calculated according to the body surface area. Inulin is a polysaccharide produced by roots of many plants, most commonly chicory plant. Inulin clearance is a better measure of GFR as it is neither reabsorbed nor secreted, but this requires infusion of inulin into the blood and is not suitable for routine use. Now, we should know that a small quantity of creatinine is secreted by the renal tubules, so creatinine clearance is around 7% greater than inulin clearance. The difference is not significant when GFR is normal, but when GFR is low, creatinine clearance overestimates the GFR as the tubular secretion is more. Urea is formed in the liver as a result of protein metabolism. Majority of it is excreted by the kidney and is partially reabsorbed by the tubules. Urea is inferior to serum creatinine as a kidney function test because its concentration varies according to diet, for example, high protein diet leads to increased urea formation and its concentration decreases with low protein intake or in case of liver disease. In conditions like starvation, Cushing syndrome or thyrotoxicosis, protein catabolism is increased, leading to increased urea formation. And lastly, 100% of urea is not filtered at the glomerulus. Normal range of blood urea is between 10 to 50 mg per deciliter. States associated with increased level of urea in blood are referred to uremia or azotemia. Serum creatinine and urea show a hyperbolic relationship with GFR. Small changes in their values are related to large changes in the GFR. Now, most of these tests assess glomerular function. As compared to assessment of glomerular function, there are no easily performed tests that measure tubular function. The few tests that are available include measurement of osmolality ratio of urine and plasma, measurement of specific protein urea, for example beta 2 microglobulin, 
This is a small peptide that is completely filtered by the glomeruli and is reabsorbed and catabolized by tubular cells. Thus, its measurement provides a sensitive method of assessing tubular integrity. Third thing is the urine concentration test. In this, patient is asked to void urine completely at 9 pm. Desmopressin is administered in the form of a nasal spray and subsequent urine is collected till morning 7 am. Urine osmolality is tested in this sample and the value should be more than 950 milliosmoles per kg of urine. The ureters The ureters are retroperitoneal paired tubular structures that carry urine from the kidney to the bladder. The ureter begins as the pelvis that is placed posterior to the renal artery and renal vein at the hilum. As it courses downwards and medially in front of psoas major muscle, it takes an S-shaped curve to reach the fundus of the bladder. It is around 25 to 30 cm in length and 3 to 4 mm in diameter. It can be divided anatomically into pelvis of the ureter, an abdominal part, and a pelvic part. The ureters are posteriorly related to the psoas major muscle, internal and external iliac vessels, genitofemoral nerve, gonadal vessels, tips of transverse processes of lumbar vertebrae, and ovaries in females. Anteriorly, the right ureter is covered by the parietal peritoneum, C of duodenum, right colic and ileocolic vessels, the mesentery, Terminal ileum and vast deference in males. The left ureter is covered by the parietal peritoneum, left colic vessels, mesentery and the sigmoid mesocolon. Pelvic part of ureter can be divided into three parts. First part is vertical or posterolateral. It runs downwards along lateral wall of pelvic cavity along the anterior border of greater sciatic notch. It lies in front of the hypogastric artery and medial to the obturator nerve, umbilical, obturator, inferior vesicle and middle hemorrhoidal arteries. The second part is anteromedial. At the lower part of greater sciatic notch, the ureter turns medially to reach the bladder where it is around 5 cm away from the opposite ureter. In males, this part is crossed anteriorly by the ductus deferens as we can see here. In females, it passes below the root of broad ligament, lateral to vaginal fornix and is crossed superiorly by the uterine artery. The third part is intravesical. In the last part, it runs obliquely for around 2 cm inside the bladder wall and opens at the corners of the trigone as slit-like apertures. This oblique course of the ureter through the wall of the bladder helps in preventing backflow of urine from the bladder as the walls of the ureter approximate each other while the bladder distends. Thus, it forms a valve-like mechanism. The ureter receives blood from segmental arteries that run longitudinally and extensively anastomose in its adventitia. The upper or the abdominal ureter receives its arterial supply on medial aspect constituted by branches from the renal artery, gonadal artery and the abdominal aorta. The middle part receives blood supply from common iliac arteries. The lower or the pelvic ureter receives its blood supply on the lateral aspect, constituted by branches from the internal iliac, superior vesicle, middle rectal, uterine and vaginal arteries in females, and inferior vesicle arteries in males. Because of the good anastomosis between these branches, during surgery, ureter can be safely transected at any level without compromising its viability. Venous drainage closely follows the arterial supply. The upper ureter drains into the lumbar nodes. The middle ureter drains to the common and internal iliac lymph nodes. And the pelvic ureter drains into the internal iliac and vesical lymph nodes. The sympathetic supply comes from T10 to L2 levels of the spinal cord along with autonomic inputs from aorticorenal, superior and inferior hypogastric plexuses. The strong peristaltic waves of contraction pass down the ureter to propel the urine to the bladder. Extensive distension by a stone will provoke severe pain that is referred to T10 to L2 dermatome that is from loin to groin including the scrotum, labia majora and proximal aspect of thigh.
Parasympathetic supply is derived from S2 to S4 segment. The ureter has three physiologic narrowings. Number one, the pelvi ureteric junction. Number two, when it is crossing over the iliac vessels at the pelvic brim. And number three, at the ureterovesical junction. These are the common sites for impaction of stones. Moreover, these narrowings may also limit retrograde instrumentation. The ureter is most exposed to surgical injury in the pelvis. At the pelvic brim, when ovarian vessels and ligaments are ligated during resection of ovaries, while clamping uterine arteries during hysterectomy and during removal of broad ligament tumours. Under the microscope, we see that the cut section of the ureter shows the mucosa that is lined by transitional cell epithelium, the lamina propria, the muscular layer which is composed of an inner longitudinal and outer circular layers and the outermost adventitia. The transitional epithelium consists of a layer of small basal cells and multiple layers of columnar cells. The hallmark of this epithelium is the large rounded apical cells known as umbrella cells. These cells have the capacity to stretch and flatten when the organ distends, avoiding damage to the epithelial lining. Most often, ureteric insult results from obstruction or injury. Other causes include congenital anomalies, infections and tumors. The urinary bladder The urinary bladder is a hollow muscular organ sitting on the pelvic floor that collects and stores urine. It has a shape of a three-sided pyramid with the apex directed forward and its base directed backwards. So, it has an upper surface known as the dome of the bladder and two infralateral surfaces. The inferior angle of the pyramid from where the urine flows out is called the neck of the bladder. The trigone is the smooth triangular area between the openings of right and left ureters and the internal urethral orifice. In childhood, urinary bladder is an abdominal organ even when it is empty and begins to enter the enlarging pelvis at around 6 years of age. It then becomes an entirely pelvic organ after puberty. In adult males, the upper surface of urinary bladder is related to the peritoneum, coils of ileum and sigmoid colon. The base is related to seminal vesicles, ejaculatory duct and rectum, while the neck of the bladder is encircled by the prostate gland. In females, the upper surface of the bladder is related to the uterus and cervix. The peritoneal reflection in between these two organs is called the uterovesical pouch. The base and neck of the bladder are in relation to the anterior vaginal wall. The urinary bladder receives its blood supply mainly from the internal iliac artery and in part from the obturator artery and inferior gluteal artery. In females, it is via the uterine and vaginal arteries. The venous return closely follows the arterial supply and drains into the internal iliac veins. The lymphatic drainage from the bladder is mainly to the internal iliac lymph nodes along with obturator, external iliac and common iliac lymph nodes. The bladder wall is supplied by both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The detrusor muscle gets its parasympathetic supply from S1 to S3 segments that synapse in bladder wall. These are excitatory to the detrusor muscle and inhibitory to the internal urethral sphincter. The sympathetic fibers come from the T10 to L2 segments via the hypogastric and pelvic nerves which have inhibitory action on detrusor muscle. The bladder wall is composed of three layers. The mucosa that is composed of the transitional epithelium and the lamina propria. The muscularis layer also known as the detrusor muscle that consists of the inner longitudinal, middle circular and outer longitudinal layers. This is covered on the outside by the serosa. Now let us understand how micturation occurs. A normal bladder functions through a complex coordination of muscular, neurologic and psychological functions. The bladder neck has two sphincters, an internal sphincter that works under autonomic nervous system and an external sphincter that is under voluntary control.
Our bladder can hold up to 600 to 800 ml of urine. When the volume reaches around 400 ml, it is perceived as sensation of fullness and a desire to maturate. Parasympathetic supply coming from the sacral region of the spinal cord contracts the detrusor muscle. The internal urethral sphincter relaxes followed by the external urethral sphincter thus causing micturition. If micturition is not convenient at a time, impulses are sent from the brain through the somatic motor neurons via the pudendal nerve that keep the external urethral sphincter contracted thus holding the urine. The urethra. From the base of the bladder emerges the urethra. The male urethra is longer and takes a curved path and can be divided into three parts. The prostatic urethra, membranous urethra and the penile urethra. The prostatic urethra is the widest part and is surrounded by the prostate gland. The membranous part of the urethra is the shortest part and is surrounded by the external urethral sphincter. The penile urethra or the spongy urethra is the longest part and is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum of the penis. The bulbourethral glands open in the penile urethra. The urethra opens on the tip of gland's penis as the external urethral orifice. This is the narrowest part of the male urethra. The female urethra is shorter and opens directly in front of the vaginal vestibule. Because of its short length, women are more prone to develop urinary tract infections. The female urethra is related to the anterior vaginal wall throughout its length. The internal urethral orifice is surrounded by the internal sphincter and the lower two-thirds of the urethra is surrounded by the external urethral sphincter. This is a horseshoe-shaped sphincter that is deficient posteriorly and is fixed against the anterior vaginal wall. The paraurethral or the skein's glands are present in the wall of distal urethra. The blood supply to the urethra comes from the internal pudendal artery and inferior vesicle artery. Venous drainage is through the internal pudendal veins. Lymph from the entire female urethra and the prostatic and membranous male urethra drains into the internal iliac lymph nodes. Whereas that from the penile urethra drains into deep inguinal lymph nodes. Some of the lymph vessels from the urethra go to the external iliac lymph nodes and paraaortic lymph nodes and from there into the cisterna chile, thoracic duct and finally left supraclavicular lymph nodes. As we have discussed earlier, the innervation of the urethral sphincter is from both somatic and autonomous nervous system. The urethra is lined by transitional epithelium in its proximal part which changes to pseudo-stratified columnar to non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium as we proceed distally. The lamina propria is loose and richly vascularized and contains a thin layer of spongy erectile tissue. The muscularis is composed of an inner longitudinal and outer circular layers that forms the internal urethral sphincter. In the distal portion, the muscle is striated and forms the external urethral sphincter.